welcome to the GoTo Podcast. Each episode covers the brightest and boldest ideas from the world's leading experts in software development. Tune in for practical lessons, compelling theories, and plenty of inspiration. GoTo gathers the brightest minds in the software community to help developers tackle projects today, plan for tomorrow, and create a better future. Stay up to date with the latest in tech through GoTo's top-rated events held online and in person in cities like Amsterdam, London, Copenhagen, and Chicago, and by subscribing to the GoTo Conference's YouTube channel, where you can find thousands more high-quality dev talks. Learn more at gotopia.tech. Well, hello. My name is Hans Loet. I work as Head of Learning and Development for Access, and I'm here today with Mark Randall, um, and we're here to talk about programming mistakes. Mark, can you introduce yeah. yourself? So, hi, I am Mark Randall, and I am a software engineer and speaker, and uh, I do kind of light-hearted, funny talks as closing keynotes and lock notes and things. And I am also available for children's parties. So your talk that you're doing here yeah. um, at Go to Amsterdam is about programming mistakes. Programming's greatest mistakes. Programming's greatest mistakes. Now I can interpret that title in a number of ways. Mm-hmm. Either they could have been mistakes made by programmers Yep. Or it could have been mistakes in things like language design, or it could have been stuff that we used software for that we maybe really shouldn't have, right? Yeah. So, so which angle are you attacking the uh, mistakes from? It's mostly the first one. So it's okay. mostly uh, mistakes that have been made either by programmers uh, or sort of someone involved in the software development process. Um, And for most of them, there's a dollar value attached. Right. And and then there's also a couple of things where it's kind of, and then people do this when they are programming or there is a tendency to do this. And that is a mistake as well. And, you know, ending up with a, a particular programming language <coughs> script. Um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but no, mostly it's just kind of like, uh, so they were doing this and somebody got this wrong and this is what happened and this is how much money that cost. Right. Um, because we've all made mistakes, right? Yes. And I put a couple of mine in there, actually, because okay. I don't want to be kind of going, oh, look at all these idiots. And so actually the first one that I talk about is something very, very stupid that I did once. Um, What what was your own worst mistake, so to speak? uh, I mean, I have a couple from myself in mind, but... So um, the the one that I talk about in the talk, and I I probably won't go into it too much here because bad language, but also it's going to be recorded so you can watch it on the GoTo channel. Um, is about a piece of software. Someone said, write this piece of software. And I gave it a name with a very rude word in it. Uh, And then somebody accidentally released that to a customer with the rude (laughs) words still in it. I was just kind of like, yeah, okay, that wasn't... um, But that was just a whole unprofessional kind of thing. Right, it doesn't strike me Um, as something that has cost the business a lot of money, unless they lost a customer because of it. the, the one that I look back on and just kind of still go, ah, was, um, I think I was 17, uh, very, very early in my career. And uh, we were at a customer's site, and this was in the days of um, Unix, like pre-Linux, 1990, 91. Um, and I had a laptop, Huge, when it was just a huge, great thing with the old sort of very slow LCD display and everything. And there was no graphical user interface. It was just you had uh, multiple consoles and you could switch between the consoles by pressing Alt and F1, F2, F3, F4, F5. Right. Yeah. And so I had a console open. We had a new version of the software on the laptop 
and we had uh, the live customer system and I was remote shelled uh, when it was just RSH. There was no SSH, it was just RSH. And so I was on the customer's actual production machine. On one um, of your eight? On one of my eight mm. consoles. Okay. <laughs> uh, and so I had to copy the database file, and this is in the days of CISAM, so it was just a .dbs file, that was it. Um, into the laptop so that we could do testing and make sure that the new version of the software worked with the database. And so I just kind of went, okay, so we're, right, I need to clear this one out. So rm minus rf bn3.dbs. Hang on. What console am I on? Who am I? Oh. <laughs> so you dropped the entire database. So I dropped the production database. This was at about two o'clock in the afternoon, um, which wouldn't normally have been that bad. But they'd had uh, they'd hired four temps to do data entry, and so they'd had four temps doing data entry for five hours solid. Um, <laughs> so they lost twenty hours of people typing in all this data. So that was fun, but yeah, you know, it reminds uh, me a little bit of where I. Um, I once worked for a, a company that made marketing software, mm. and part of it there was an online component to it that we got from a third-party supplier. It was my responsibility to set that up, and I was setting it up for a new customer. And well, because we had customers all over the world, I took a copy of. Um, another customer that was using the same language and a similar color design. It was also his biggest competitor in the region where he was located, right? Ah. So I took a copy of the other customer to start my configuration. And part of it was a sync job that had to sync between their on-prem system and the online one. Mm -hmm. And the default used to be that the welcome emails to my customers, customers didn't go out by default. So what we would do is we would enable the sync and then send out the welcome emails after everything had been set up yeah. properly. Um, our, our supplier had changed that default and I didn't bother to check with them. Yeah. So I enabled the sync and the sync had finished by the time that we noticed that the welcome emails had gone out been going, yeah. in the email template of his biggest competitor with the brand of his biggest competitor in the emails, 60,000 emails. Oh, yeah, that's that's yeah. bad. That's, you know, that's so that's my biggest fuck up. That's worse than mine. That, yeah, that's it worse sounds than like mine. it. Um, but even that sort of pales into insignificance when you look at some of the things where a programmer at NASA um, right. or the European Space Agency or, um, or Boeing or, <laughs> or yeah. whatever, when they make a mistake, um, or when there's lives at stake, there's, and, there's, and, and there's stake. like very expensive equipment that yes. can burn up. Yeah. And, and um, I because the talk is kind of lighthearted, and it's just me making jokes and and mm -hmm. taking the Mickey out of people. Um, I specifically don't talk about mm -hmm. uh, airplanes or medical equipment um, or any time that a programming mistake has killed people, but. Right. When I was researching the talk, there have been a lot of times when programming and that I don't think I would want to write software that had the potential to to hurt okay. people. So you know, like guidance systems for uh, autopilot systems for airplanes. Um, there was a particular, uh, I think it was a medical scanner, um, which gave like thousands of people a lethal dose of radiation before they realized okay. it was happening because it was kind of, it was lethal, but it was kind of in three months, you're going to develop tumors. Right. And so it kept in three going. months, you can, three put months, a lot you can of scan people a lot a of scanner. people. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't talk about those because I don't want to depress or upset how, people. How about like, let's, let's take a more lighthearted angle on that. How about we calculate um, like time wasted in lifetimes? So if you do something that wastes a lot of people's time because of a decision that you made in software. Yeah. 
That that also has a price tag. It's not a not a dollar amount, but that it's like be, that could be quite interesting. If I you, know that Tim Berners Lee was was always regretted the HTTPW uh, colon slash slash www URL prefix because yeah. it's like it doesn't need to be there. Yeah, because that's the thing about the internet that wastes people's time. <laughs> well. <laughs> At least, <clears throat> like, just me saying that to you. Yes. It's um, like, certainly, I mean... The, I mean, all those little bits all over the world, it adds up. The HTTP colon slash slash. Um, the <laughs> www always annoyed me because for some reason they decided that the letter W was going to have three syllables. So it actually, it's easier to say World, world Wide Web. It's quicker it's, to say World Wide Web yeah. than it is to say www. Um, but uh, no, I, mean, uh, uh, I would like to know how much time has been lost because um, Windows decided it was going to reboot itself to update and people oh. hadn't saved their work. Um, because I, I think if you added all that up, that's probably hundreds of thousands of hours yeah. of time that's Couple been wasted. A couple of lifetimes, at yeah. least. Yeah. yeah. Um, but no, the talk, it's, it's kind of uh, this spacecraft blew up and it cost this much and this building collapsed and it cost this much to fix it. Um, and the, this hedge fund lost an eye-watering amount of money in, because th the in trading? three hours. <laughs> yeah, automatic trading. Yeah. Um, and, and it's interesting there because there's the, this was the error in programming that caused the problem. But you can also have a discussion about mm -hmm. whether, like you mentioned earlier, the thing that they are doing, is that a thing that should be done? Exactly. Um, because, you know, these days the, there are entirely autonomous little algorithms running inside servers, inside the data centers of the New York Stock Exchange, or the London Stock Exchange, and so forth, just executing trades milliseconds apart to mm -hmm. try and cream off 0.0001% of a... Uh, of a cent, right. which because it all adds up over the course of a day, mm -hmm. they can do hundreds of millions of dollars of trades. And so mm -hmm. those fractions of a percent of a cent all add up to, to real money. I don't know if it's um, an actual thing, but somebody was, was explaining to me that if you want to go into day trading, um, one of the things that you can take advantage of is when the algorithms overreact to a certain, yeah, um, overreact to a certain ev uh, evolution in the stock price. Yes, you can take advantage of that because you know that like all the algorithms are selling right now, so it is for me the time yeah. to buy. This is, yeah. and when it corrects itself and goes back up, you sell when it goes back up, and you make money on yes. that. Yes, yeah. Although, uh, yeah, I, I, I have to come down, sort of on the side of the whole trading thing now. Yeah, it's it's gone rotten. So yeah, the the very concept of of trading because you know stock markets was originally a way for people to raise money, raise money for companies to, and invest in and other build companies chips yeah. and that sort of thing. And now it's become like autonomous, a virtual thing to make money for yeah. people who already have money. Exactly. It's, yeah, it, and it doesn't contribute. Anything to society? No. Um, well, no. But, Probably uh, not. You know, and when I talk to people who disagree with me, they just kind of go, "Well, what does Xbox or Facebook contribute to society?" Or and I have to kind of go, "Oh, well, certainly Bitcoin." Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, Bitcoin. Uh, there is there's a version of the slide deck somewhere that just has a single slide that says Bitcoin, <laughs> um, and uh, the idea was I was just going to do it and then just stand there and not say anything and then just move on to the next one because, yeah, that's just a ridiculous mistake. Though. Yes, yeah. Um, but yeah, and that's, 
that is one of the things that I have mixed feelings about is uh, not Bitcoin, but like blockchain technology. Um, I think it's a beautiful solution to a problem that doesn't exist. That nobody has. Yeah. Yeah. It's like technically and theoretically, it's blockchain and, and the distributed ledger and all of that. It's like, okay, this is a great solution. And whenever I have seen it applied, my thought has been like, this could have been done so much simpler. Yes. Yeah. Um, the, I mean, the issue with, you can do a distributed ledger where you don't need millions of GPUs trying to guess a big number. Yeah. Well, yeah, that is then proof of work. I yeah. mean, you can still do proof of stake and, and yes. it takes the compute factor out of it. Um, but proof of, <laughs> even proof of stake, I mean, proof of stake is uh, I have enough money to, yeah. um, to take over this thing. And there was, that guy, there was that thing quite recently, a guy gamed the system on a particular blockchain that gave him more than 50% of the voting rights then right. voted to give himself all the money. Um, and then I think he borrowed money from people on this thing where you can borrow like cryptocurrency mm-hmm. for five minutes and then it automatically reverts back to the people. So yeah. they, there is no risk for them to lend you the money. And so he borrowed this enormous amount of money, used it to vote to give himself all the money in this blockchain, and then it reverted back. And he just had all this ether or whatever it was. Um, and, and then all the other people who have got that sort of uh, in, in that organization, that's suddenly the point at which they want the FBI or, or the Interpol or whatever to get involved and regulate the unregulated currency because um, it turns out when code is law, you can actually do some, some horrendous things. Um, yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's one of the things that I've always found really suspicious about the whole NFT scene as well. Because we're artificially inflating the value of a digital proof of ownership, literally. Yeah. yeah. Um, and like whatever it's worth is 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 yeah. whatever what anybody pays for it. But you can sell an NFT to another account made by yourself. Yes. So you'll buy it for two hundred euros and you'll sell it to yourself for seventy five thousand euros. Yeah, I think they call it washing or something. Yeah. So so that 75k goes from your pocket to your pocket, so yeah. you don't really care. But now you have artificially inflated mm-hmm. the value, the perceived value of your digital proof of ownership. Yeah. And then you'll sell it for sheep for 30k or whatever. Yeah. Um, but I, I and think, there is no regulation. No. At um, all. And I think we've pretty much established at this point that um, whether the Bored Ape Yacht Club knew it or not, the main reason people were buying and selling pictures of monkeys was that they were laundering drug money. Probably. And, yeah. So (laughs) you're you're not the pioneers of a new era of digital creativity. Mm -hmm. You're Jason Bateman in Ozark, or Ozark, or wherever that's pronounced. And um, so, yeah, but no, Bitcoin, that's that's definitely a mistake. Um, And... Yeah, and then I have I have JavaScript in there. Sure. Um, I mean, you don't have to preach that to me. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, the the thing with JavaScript, though, I don't think JavaScript itself is a mistake. Uh, and what I actually say in the talk is that if you know that sort of if you had a time machine and you could go back and fix one thing, and I would go to Netscape uh, six months before JavaScript they told Brendan nice. Ike yeah. to, to create JavaScript and just, you know, um, in about six months, Mark's going to come and ask you to create a scripting language to put it into the browser. I build um, it properly. <laughs> so I'm giving you a start working on it now and design it properly. Also, they're going to ask you to make it look like Java. Don't stick to scheme. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, and just come back and see what the internet looks and like. And that, that is, I mean, it is a similar story to VHS versus Betamax. Like yeah. you have a, a technically superior solution, but 
something becoming ubiquitous in the, in the market basically di- dictates what everybody is going to use. Yeah. And, and JavaScript yeah. is is a perfect example. We use it for everything. And kind yeah. of runs everywhere as well. Mm-hmm. And we even have a song about that, don't we? We do. <laughs> we do. Um, we'll play it tonight <laughs> at GoTo. But, but you as the watcher of the video, you're not going to see that. Uh, uh, but it's... And and it's it's all in jest because it's probably one of the most used and, and most popular programming languages at the moment. And JavaScript is in no way still the language that it was in the beginning as it was released oh, yeah. in, Nef- in Abs- Nefsky. Absolutely. It um, has definitely evolved to be something much more powerful and much more workable. Yeah. Um, but some of the remnants are still there, right? Uh, yes. But I remember... Uh, you know that photo of JavaScript, the definitive guide, and JavaScript, the good part, the good next part, to which yes. I took that photo um, and tweeted it back in 2010, 2011, and it went viral. Um, 45,000 likes, and I went from like 100 followers to 1,500 followers overnight. Um, but yes, JavaScript today... Uh, there are two good things about it. One, we now have evergreen browsers. Mm -hmm. And so uh, apart from Safari, there's much less weight from this is the new standard to, and now it works in Edge and Chrome and Firefox and Safari. Um, (laughs) But, you know, so now we can use arrow functions just natively. Yeah. We don't have to worry about running it through Babel or TypeScript or whatever. And and there's a whole bunch of stuff in there that we can actually use and make work. Um, but I think the thing with JavaScript at the moment is the ecosystem around it, uh, particularly front end. Right. So React and uh, Vue and Svelte and Astro and Nuxt and Next and all these different things. And whether each of those individual technologies is good or bad, and whether, you know, React, is that a large download size? Can you use Preact instead? Does Svelte have better performance and a nicer developer experience and all that sort of thing? But I mean, every, fact- every one of those frameworks has been invented to solve a, to scratch a particular itch yes. that its author had. Yeah. So I would argue that they all have a reason for being. I mean, React is interesting because they invented it to scratch an itch, found out it didn't actually scratch that itch, and reverted to a different way of doing that thing. But React lives on. Mm-hmm. Uh, but no, it's just the the npm and the the oh. number of dot files and dot editor config and dot. Tsconfig.json yeah. and package.json and eslint.config.json. It's just mad. It's yeah. it's like COBOL. And you know, and, and the thing ang- is, Angular, of course. The, and, the, and then the whole the whole left bet thing that happened. Yeah. That hasn't been fixed no. in the entire no, ecosystem. It, hasn't. it could happen again. Yeah. Um, if so- somebody decides to pull their package that is a dependency for a whole bunch of things. And there's probably thousands of yeah. packages out there that could break a significant part of the JavaScript ecosystem. Yep. And it's all being compiled. Well, it's not being compiled. It's all being pulled in as source from NPM. Yeah. So potentially we can have that again. Yeah. And uh, it, you know, if you were an immoral person, you could write a really useful, very simple thing put it on NPM, and then you don't even have to figure out how to do a bad thing yourself. You don't even actually have to commit a crime yourself. You can just give control of that package and that GitHub repo to somebody who does want to do a bad thing, and so you enable them to commit a crime, Um, and then they can use that to install Bitcoin mining or whatever it is they want to do. Oh yeah, or and there's um, very little comeback on you for that. This is not a how-to. Do not do that. Okay, please. Thank you. Well, Bitcoin mining is is stealing CPU cycles, but JavaScript is often running that's, on that's what both JavaScript front, does anyway. Front end, back end, it can sniff authentication tokens. It it can get access to database connection strings. Yeah, I mean, 
if you have a package like that, like the impact that you can have on certain businesses is way bigger than yes. running some Bitcoin miners. Yeah. And this is the big thing. And, and, you know, this isn't, to be fair, this is not just a JavaScript thing. This is no. a pip Python thing. This is a Gradle Maven thing. It's a NuGet thing. Um, it's a cargo thing, you know, even Rust yeah. with all its guarantees. So, yeah, it's definitely, uh, it's the problem. Are you arguing that package managers are a big mistake in the programming world as well? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have this this sort of thought that landed in my head one day and it, it's never really gone away. Uh, as a society, as a world, there is an enormous amount of time and energy and money that goes into things that we wouldn't have to do if people were just fundamentally honest. You right. know, if you If everybody just went, this is my Gmail account. And all I should have to tell the computer when I want to log into my Gmail, hi, it's me. And it shouldn't need a password <laughs> because other people shouldn't want to read my Gmail. Mm-hmm. Um, and I shouldn't need to keep iterating on things. And we shouldn't need TLS right. and SSL and HTTPS and all these sorts of things. We, we're spending vast quantities of, of energy. You were talking about and stock everything exchanges else. a while yes. ago, right? So, yeah. I mean, um, that dishonesty I mean, or, well, I wouldn't say that, that stock trading is dishonest, but like this, this trying to get ahead by exploiting whatever people can in the system yeah. is something yeah. that is probably rooted into human I, nature. And, you know, sometimes it's dishonest, the 2008 thing, the, the big short and yeah. the mortgage crisis and, and everything. That was, that was dishonest. fundamentally yeah. dishonest. If you take the bottom 5% of 20 things mm-hmm. and then put it together in one, that, those are, that's just now 100% bad things. But you, then you can still say, oh, this is the top 5%. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, but it was the bottom five. Yeah, so yeah, but um, but yeah, you know the the amount of programming time and effort and energy that's gone into just stopping people from being dicks or lulls. Um, <laughs> and you people of, people learned the Dutch word for dick yesterday evening while we were yeah. throwing darts because my nickname became lul yeah. uh, on the dart system. Um, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, you, I, I, and I just, I, I, it just occurred to me how much further along would we be as a species if all the smart people who've had to spend their time could focus on fighting stuff. human nature had just been able to go, actually, what, what can I do to make the world a better place? Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, basically, if you've ever, ever done anything bad or told a lie or uh, or just anything. If you are not completely innocent and virtuous, then you've killed us all. And I hope you're pleased with yourself. Wow, that took a t- turn for the... Uh... <laughs> yeah, I should do a whole talk. <laughs> <laughs> now there's other mistakes um, that we haven't really talked about, but you also have a really nice talk about those mistakes is mistakes in in programming language design Mm. that make the job of a programmer yes um let's say less less enjoyable yes the worst programming language ever yes um my most successful talk ever um i think added up it's had like Five million views total on youtube in various forms or something nice it Mm. is it's insane um and it's also, if you haven't seen it, look it up. It's a hilarious talk. It yeah, really is. It, I, I'm, I'm very, very proud of that talk. And uh, people think it's going to be mean. People think it's going to be me deciding which is the worst programming language ever, which it isn't. It is um, start with a programming language that I don't like. It's a lot better than it used to be, but I still don't like it. Um, but then progressively make it worse by adding just the weirdest, worst features of other programming languages. I mean, what, one that you made up, but that I really liked because of how evil it is, is the um, 
prime numbered line numbers that needed to be in yes sequential primes yeah sequential yeah. primes and and as soon as you like want to add a line somewhere yes um, yeah so so that um, was particularly evil but you also pulled stuff from other programming languages stuff that yeah. has already been done but yes. that was horrible yeah um so like unless from ruby mm -hmm. uh which just no <laughs> Just throw an exception unless something isn't false. And he's just kind of like, that's the wrong way around. That's, yeah. Um, <laughs> and actually, there's a, a linguist, I can't remember his name, but said, uh, unless is responsible for so much stress. Um, mm -hmm. Because you do, you say bad thing unless condition. <laughs> um, so, so there's that... Uh, so yes. you're, you're pleading here that we should all be going, if this yeah. isn't true, then... Yeah, if, if a bad thing has happened, then raise an exception. Not yeah. raise an exception unless a bad thing hasn't happened. Yeah. That's just the wrong way around. Uh, but no, it takes, um, it takes date formatting from Go, which I only learned about quite recently. And I won't spoil it for you, but um, Go's date formatting is just weird. It's weird, um, and uh, it's it's quite fun finding out sort of where various like so it takes eval from fourth I believe mm -hmm. uh, is where that came from um, macros uh, which it sort of takes from C and C plus <laughs> plus um, but then uh, it kind of goes. But, you know, to make macros properly powerful, we should do them as regular expressions. Hmm. And the idea of having the compiler just run a bunch of regular expressions over your code as part of the build process just tickled me. Um, but the really nice thing is I've done the talk a few times and uh, I always leave 10 minutes at the end and open it up to the room because... Yeah, I've used quite a lot of programming languages over the last 30 years, but people have used stuff I haven't used. Um, and so I'm kind of like, so what would you suggest from programming languages that you use? And you get people who've used, there's a, system, a language that was used for building healthcare software, and it was called Mumps. And one of the features of Mumps was that you could shorten any keyword to the minimum amount of letters before it became unique. And so, of course, because you could do that, everybody did do that. So, mumps code is unreadable. Uh, oh, so instead of so, while, you can maybe get away with WH. Yes, exactly. Stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, wow. And uh, so, that's fun. Um, and then now they go on YouTube and they go viral every now and then. And I suddenly start getting emails and things. And the YouTube comments is just people going, oh, you think that's bad, you should try this. And it's literally thousands of comments. So that's how you wrote um, part of that talk? Yeah, I mean, I, I sort of pick things out that I really like and I iterate on the talk and I add stuff into it. And um, yeah, but no, it's, it's great fun. And I don't think it's mean. People worry that it's mean. And it's kind of like, oh, no, you just, it's if a good you picked on one language, then it would be me. That, yeah. Um, but saying, I don't like that feature of that language and, and explaining why. There's a lot of mistakes in programming language design that yeah. were meant really well that have caused us all a lot of pain. No. No, for no. instance. Yes, yeah. like no is not a good way to represent nothingness. No. no. Um, um. And because it can mean a whole bunch of different things, yeah. right? Yeah. And then you get JavaScript, which picks up null and just runs with it because you know, undefined, which is not the same as null. Because if it's null, that means somebody set it to null. If it's undefined, nobody then has nobody set, set it to, to anything. anything. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, um, it's, uh, it's, it's like a three-state Boolean or something. Um, well, I, I would argue that those are indeed two very different things. It's yes. like, I have set this to be nothing, or nobody has set it to anything. They're totally different. Yeah. And and the the clean solution, in my opinion, to this is, is um, you can see it in a bunch of fu uh, functional languages where you have discriminated unions, where you can say, like, if I have a person, it could be that it is no person. 
Yes. And you can define that as part of a union where you have even different types of classes that can still be approached as one concept, which yeah. is something that we still don't have in, in, in C Sharp, for instance. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's one of the things that would make steering away from null as the catch-all concept for nothing yeah. would make it a whole lot more bearable. Yes, yeah. Um, option or maybe yeah. or whatever and, and being unable to um, just... or You can still... It's like Rust has mm -hmm. its result and you can call dot .unwrap. Um, which basically says, just get me the result out. And if it's not there and an error has occurred, then just dump the process and, and exit out. Um, so you can always do that. And not having null doesn't mean you can't do that. And having null, you know, C sharp is now very good. Uh, throwing up warnings going, yeah. you know, that could be null where you're doing that. And so you can at least put some guards around it. And but stuff. they're in the limbo where it is a a compiler feature and um, it's not a run, it's not baked into mm. the runtime yet, right? Mm. So you, you yeah. see all the things in your IDE and it's giving you very, very nice warnings. And I think that the evolution to be more strict about any, all of this while we're programming is a good idea. Yeah. But we could do with a few more features to make it better so that we have viable alternatives. Yes. Yeah. Um, I do. I sometimes wonder if it's time for kind of C-sharp next. So are you and .NET next drop a bunch of the stuff. I think they, okay. they, they actually tried to do it with .NET Core. I have, I have to say that like the language changes from let's say core one, mm -hmm. um, 2016, last seven years, right? The language has evolved tremendously. Yeah. Um, and I would say for the better. We now have almost effortless, effortless immutability mm -hmm. for objects, um, which is great, which is something that makes um, programming um, against immutable classes so much easier and it makes it easier to also achieve things like item potency and so on. Because mm -hmm. if you know, it's like, I'm gonna not, never going to change the contents of this, this object anymore. Yeah. Like, why not enforce it? Um, but there's a, like a whole bunch of innovations coming from um, the functional ways of thinking, making yeah. their way into C Sharp, which makes it a very, very usable language. But yes. I don't think we're there yet. No. Um, I mean, there's a bunch of stuff coming in uh, in .NET 8 uh, with frozen dictionaries, frozen hash sets, frozen mm -hmm. arrays. That's quite cool. Um, and uh, like you say, discriminated, I mean, discriminated unions would be lovely. Structural typing um, on interfaces. Mm -hmm. So you don't say it has to implement I dictionary of string objects. You can just say, it needs a string indexer that returns an object. Yeah. And then the compiler goes, yes, this does have that. Mm -hmm. uh, and that sort of thing. Um, shapes, I think they call it. Yeah. Com, funnily enough, had something like that. When you do com programming, you see there's kind of I things, but there's also S things, which is right. uh, sort of coercing it at runtime and saying it will have this method. If it doesn't, then blue screen. Uh, but yes. Um, so I think I that's, that's something we still we still have is we can define an interface, but but unless the actual class implements that's that it. interface, the class you cannot to just make a class that has those members, yeah. or you cannot define an interface that maps to a members of a class that was written by somebody else and yeah. then use that interface. Yeah, and you just think you know because C sharp's twenty three years old now. Uh, and so you kind of go, right, so I, I have this thing that um, I think would be beneficial for a lot of software projects, which is build it as fast as you can, as slapdash as you can, and then build it again from scratch and take everything you learn building it the first time, mm -hmm. but 
now write it out as clean code effectively. Don't copy and paste anything. Just yeah. so yeah, build it in three months and then build it again in a month, but just do it right. And I think we would end up with much better, more maintainable I, code. I argue practices. that that could be a practice for a lot of enterprises as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Yeah. If 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 I would get the authority, I've had this with one customer once where we would have a deal. We were building everything as vertical slices mm -hmm. and we had the ability to ship a feature quick and dirty, but it had an expiration date. Yes. So if four weeks from now you still want to keep this as a business, you're going to have to invest 10 times the amount of time to write it properly. But in the meanwhile, we can ship quick and dirty and you can be very responsive. Yeah. And the moment that that model failed was like, most of the time those features are okay, we're going to want to keep them from now. And it's like, no, we can no longer do this. Yes. Because yeah. we're effectively shipping crap to protection. Crap. But the advantage of that system is if you can do it quick and dirty, one tenth of the time, for the price of two features, you can try 10 and keep one. Yes. And if you're in, in a fast moving industry, that is tremendously valuable. And it surprises me that not a lot of teams are actually doing that no. in the world. As, uh, the, I think the problem is that from an enterprise point of view, from a, uh, from a cost center point of view, um, it's nice, clean, maintainable code doesn't have recognizable business value. No. It's kind of, well, you've done it. It's working. Why am I going to pay you to do it again? And then you go, mm -hmm. so it's still working in 10 years' time. Or so but, we can keep maintaining it or whatever. Yeah, and but that's, the CFO that's mainly honestly us. doesn't care about 10 years' time because he's probably going to have moved on by then. So, But yeah. that's mainly us failing to communicate the true cost of technical debt to business people. Yeah. Um, but it is also, I mean, sometimes it's us, you know, just don't tell them it's finished. <laughs> just, just build it. Don't tell Everybody has done, done that, right? You know, yeah. Um, it's kind of, it's, I, I worked at one place where we weren't supposed to write automated tests, so we wrote them and didn't tell people. Um, right. And uh, yeah, and then went, oh no, those aren't automated. We have to run them manually. <laughs> um, but yes, so no. I, I, I think if I wanted to spend the next twenty years of my career. Um, doing talks about programming mistakes. Uh, There's I, enough I'm of them. Pretty sure I'm never going to run out of material. Put it that way. So maybe I will. That'd be fun. Thanks so much for joining me here today. Is there like a key takeaway that you want people to have? Um, a mistake you would like to save them from by giving them a bit of advice. I would say the the primary mistake that just kept popping up over and over again was just uh, not sufficient testing. Um, people build things and they go, oh, it's impossible to do testing on that. And you're kind of like, no, it's not. You just need to apply yourself and figure out how. Um, don't assume that something is incredibly simple and it will just work. Uh, you know, just test. Um, that's probably the biggest takeaway. The people who can sort of go, well, you know, testing is difficult is the people who are sending robots to Mars. Because it's very difficult to test whether a robot is going to work on Mars. They do the best they can. No. Um, and so if we do the best we can to, to do proper testing, um, then, then we can probably That was the opening the keynote people. yesterday. Some, yes. Somebody yeah. who the, the landing mechanism for I know, and then we to build hydrogen-based airplanes, which yes. is just amazing. I love the way, can you build the landing system for the next Mars rover? Now I've done that, bored. <laughs> yes. I, um, I have a feeling that you can relate to that sentiment. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the ADD is, ADHD is strong with this one. And I, I love the fact that she went, well, I'm going to apply myself to try and improve to emissions yes. in the air in the airline industry. Yeah. And I'm gonna start doing that. And nobody's ever done it before, but I'm gonna make it work. So if that talk's available online, you should watch that one as well. It's amazing. Yeah. And Anita, we really hope that you succeed. Yes, please. Okay, cool. Thank you. 
Thanks for listening to this episode of the GoTo Podcast. Head over to gotopia.tech to discover lots more content from the brightest minds in software development. Thank you.